دی تفسیر اف سورت الانبیاء بائے شیخ عبد الناصر جنگا دی فالوئنگ ویڈیو واز ریکارڈڈ ایٹ قران انٹنسیو بیناز سمر پروگرام فار مور انفارمیشن وزٹ بیناسمر.کام This video was filmed and produced by Salam Studios and is brought to you by muslimmatters.org. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Fa man ya'mal minash salihati wa huwa mu'min fala kufrana li sa'ihi wa inna lahu katibun. وحرام على قرية أهلكناها أنهم لا يرجعون حتى إذا فتحت يأجوج ومأجوج وهم من كل حدب ينسلون وقترب الوعد الحق فإذا هي شاخصة أبصار الذين كفروا يا ويلنا قد كنا في غفلة من هذا بل كنا ظالمين إنكم وما تعبدون من دون الله حصب جهنم أنتم لها واردون لو كان هؤلاء آلهة ما وردوها وكل فيها خالدون لهم فيها زفير وهم لا وهم فيها لا يسمعون الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عاقبه للمتقين والصلاه والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين in the previous session at the end of that some of the mufassirun have actually connected the last two ayat to the passage that i just recited and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna hadhihi ummatukum ummatan wahida ayah number 92 that most definitely without a doubt this ummah of yours is one singular united ummah wa ana rabbukum fa'budun and i am your lord alone fa'budun so therefore worship me and only me allah says وَتَقَطَّعُوا أَمْرَهُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ كُلٌّ إِلَيْنَا رَاجِعُونَ And they divided up their affair, their matter between them. And we talked about the two meanings of this, that either it's making reference to the fact that they divided up the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be worshipped amongst all the idols that they had created. Or it also at the same time refers to the fact that they became very disunited amongst each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this and i wanted to kind of elaborate on this kullun ilayna raji'un we'll talk about that but in surah al-mu'minun allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyuha ar-rusulu kulu min at-tayyibati wa amalu salihan inni bima ta'maluna alim that he addresses the messengers and he says eat from those things that are pure and do those actions that are righteous and most definitely i am fully knowledgeable of everything that you do wa inna hadhihi ummatukum ummatan wahida wa ana rabbukum fattaqun and uh, most definitely without a doubt this ummah of yours is one singular united ummah and i am your lord alone so therefore worship uh, be co- be conscious of me develop taqwa be think of me fataqattau amrahum bainahum zubura Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they divided up, they broke up their affair, their matter between themselves, zuburan. What's very interesting about the word zubur is that it refers to little, little parts of like steel or iron when it's blo- broken up into small little parts. Then this was something that was so hard, so difficult, so against human nature and the fitrah to break up. But yet in spite of that, they broke this up. كُلُّ حِزْمٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ This is very interesting. And each and every single group is just completely oblivious and just going about their lives and their business with whatever they have allocated or divided for themselves. فَذَرْهُمْ فِي غَمْرَتِهِمْ حَتَّى حِينَ So Allah tells the Prophet ﷺ, leave them in their just completely lost condition until the time arrives. In Surah Al-An'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعًا That the people who divided up their religion, and because of dividing up their religion, they became split up into different different factions and groups that were opposed to one another. لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ He tells the Prophet ﷺ, you have nothing to do with them. 
You are not, you are not part of this whole scene. إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ that their affair will be led back to Allah, meaning they will have to go and answer to Allah. They will deal with Allah for how they have basically conducted themselves. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fully make them aware of everything that these people have done. So this is that same profound reality. So the Mufassirun, by pointing out these other ayat, are actually illustrating the point as we talked about, that by dividing up the religion, by segmenting the religion, they themselves became divided into different groups and factions. That was a natural consequence of that. The other thing is, parallel to that or opposite to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, the Ummah of Muhammad wasallam, about how to maintain unity. And we talked about that a little bit yesterday. Hold firmly onto the rope of Allah. And many of the Mufassirun say the Quran is the rope of Allah. Hold firmly onto the rope of Allah together, all together. And do not become divided amongst yourselves. And then he goes on to remind them that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them. That remember the blessing of Allah upon you is kuntum a'da'an. When you were enemies of one another, and this was something that was witnessed at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, in the community of the Prophet ﷺ, the Ansar before Islam arrived were at war with one another. Aus and Khazraj used to be enemies of one another. فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ He joined your hearts together through this. Blessing of Islam, for asbahtum bi ni'matihi, and you became because of this blessing, ikhwanan, brothers of one another. So enemies becoming brothers, and that was solely through this blessing of Islam and adherence to the Book of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and following the example of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is something that was pointed out, and then finally Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as he did in these other places as well, kullun ilayna rajiun, all of them are returning back to us. We will deal with them. You do your job, you do the preaching and the teaching of the religion, deliver the message and leave the rest to us. Let us deal with them, let us handle them, let us, you know, um, let, basically let us sort them out. Now here in ayah number 94, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the believing community. Addressing the believing community now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ This is a general address, but we do see that the believers, there is something, some, some specific instruction to the believers, for the believers that is provided here. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ So whoever, now I'm going to point out, this ayah is very beautiful linguistically. The word يَعْمَلْ is the present tense form, the mudari'ah, fi'al mudari'ah. So this is the present tense form. One of the rhetorical benefits of the present tense form is that it implies, it has a subtlety of an action that continues. At-tajdeed wa takrar For an action to continue and to renew itself. So, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ means those who will consistently continue to the best of their ability, but they will continue to do مِنَ salihat. What's very interesting, the word min, which means from, min li tab'id. Min in the Arabic language is used to show a part of something. That just means a little bit. So those who will con continuously, consistently try to do a little bit. And then Allah says, As-salihat. As-salihat in the Arabic language is a, an adjective, a sifa. The mosuf of the sifa, the, um, the noun, the ism that is being described by the adjective here, the mosuf is al-a'mal. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ الصَّالِحَاتِ But the mosuf, the, 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 the item being described, deeds, actions, is omitted. Why is that done? But the adjective is left there. The mosuf is omitted. But the adjective, the sifa, remains. Because the mosuf is what demonstrates the numbers. Allah is taking the focus away from the quantity. What remains is the adjective, the quality, as-salihat, which means righteous, good, good deeds. So Allah, by eliminate, eliminating and not mentioning the mosuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually emphasizes the goodness of the deeds, the quality of the deeds. 
The third observ or rather the fourth observation here linguistically. Typically in the Arabic language and Quran intensive students, y'all can answer this. Al-A'mal, which is a broken plural, Jama'u Taksir, Jama'a Mukassar, its adjective will be what? Singular feminine. It'll be singular feminine. Based off of that rule in grammar, the adjective should be as-saliha. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ الصَّالِحَةِ As-saliha, with the ta at the end, singular feminine. This, if you look at it, is as-salihat. It's the plural feminine. So what do we do? So first and foremost, if based on the grammar of the language, this is a huge red flag. This is drawing and calling your attention. When you pay attention to it, what do we find? When you look in, when you study the Arabic language and you study eloquence and rhetoric and study poetry, what you actually find is that when the singular feminine should be used, but instead of that, the plural feminine is used, one of the benefits of doing that is, for, of course, it makes it abnormal. And the benefit of the abnormality is that it's talking about a smaller quantity. Something like we would call three to nine. Less than a dozen. And then if you're talking about any number of things, even a larger quantity possibly, then it would go back to the norm. as the singular feminine. So we got four things here. Number one, ya'mal. Allah did not say, فَمَنْ عَمِلَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا What does it normally say in the Quran? Surah Al-Asr, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا وَعَمِلُوا عَمِلَ عَمَلًا Right? It's, it's the past tense that's normally used. Allah uses the present tense. That in and of itself signifies, implies consistency. Number one, note number one. The second thing is the word min. Min signifies, implies a part of, a little bit of, fewer, some. Number three, the, the noun being described, the mawsuf, is omitted, which again takes away the focus from the actual deed, meaning the quantity of the deeds itself. It takes the focus away from there. The fourth and the final note, or rather we should say there's five notes, the, most, the sifa, the adjective stays, and the adjective is talking about quality, not quantity. And fifthly and finally, even the adjective is abnormal. And this type of abnormal adjective normally signifies a smaller quantity of things. When you put all of them together, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, quantity does not matter. It is the quality that is the key. Quantity does not matter. It is the quality that is the key. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes that not one, but three different ways. He takes away, he says a little bit, min, takes away the, the, the mosuf, which again, takes away the focus from the quantity. And then again, he stresses a smaller number of deeds by mentioning the abnormal adjective, sifa. But then by leaving the adjective there, Allah is emphasizing the quality and the last note to add everything, so no quantity. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiple ways is taking away the focus from quantity. He is emphasizing the quality and the first thing that I pointed out, that with quality, there's one other thing that we, that we need, and that is consistency. Do something like the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ahabu wa in qalb. That the most beloved of deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the ones done with mo the most consistency. And by the way, consistency in and of itself is a sign of quality. Because something worthwhile is something that you look forward to again. Alright, so the most beloved deeds to Allah are the ones done with consistency, even if they be very few, very little. So this is very profound here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that those who do good deeds with quality, not worrying too much about quantity initially, but they focus on quality, and they do it with consistency. Number two, And that person is a believer. And again, it doesn't say amanu in the verbal form. It says it in the nominal form. He is a believer, which means that he is committed to his faith. So he or she is committed to their faith, 
and they are consistent with good deeds, and they try their best to put forth the best deed possible, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنُونَ Then what will be the dealing with that person? This is what this person is presenting. What is that person being met with from Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا كُفْرَانَ لِسَعْيِهِ فَلَا كُفْرَانَ لِسَعْيِهِ This is very, again very interesting. The word kufran, kafara, kufr, means to be ungrateful for something. It means to be ungrateful for something. Kufran. Does that remind you all of a type of a noun that we studied? The, 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 the super noun. Ism mubalagha. Right? Ism mubalagha. This is the hyperbolized noun. Right? The ism that emphasizes the meaning of it. So, فَلَا kufrana. There will be absolutely, positively, no underappreciation, ingratitude, in any way, shape, or form. And then that too, la, this la, remember we talked about the types of negation? There's a normal la, but then there is a super la, special one. Epic la, right? La lina fil jins, the one that is categorical denial. La kufrana. There will be absolutely, positively no underappreciation, lack of acknowledgement, lisa'ihi, for his efforts, for that person's efforts. And again, there's a very subtle note in there. The word sa'i in the Arabic language means to run towards something. We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to appreciate what we are doing. Well, then we have to put our best foot forward. We have to try our best. We might not be capable of much. We maybe can't guarantee the outcome. We can. We can't guarantee the outcome. I might not be capable of much. But what I can do is I can try my best. I can at least try. Asa'yu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this many, many times in the Quran. Falay yukfaru. People who try their best, lay yukfaru. Those people will not be underappreciated. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that somebody who does good, sa'yan mashkuran. That person's effort will be appreciated. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying as long as a person is trying his or her best, la kufrana, they will not be, it will not be neglected or overlooked in the least bit. Wa inna lahu katibun. And most definitely we are for that person. Katibun. Katibun, katib is one who writes. But again, in the nominal form, one who is writing consistently. Katibun, those who are writing down. We, will, we are constantly, for the sake of those people. And see, what's, what else is very interesting is that there's two prepositions that can be used here. You can use the preposition lahu, that's in someone's favor. Or you can use the preposition ala, alayhi. That's against someone, to collect Evidence, proof against someone. Lahu is to write down credit for someone. To write down something for someone's credit, in someone's credit, to someone's credit. To note down their accomplishments. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, based on what He has said, people who are consistent, striving for quality, trying their best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are writing everything down in their favor. And this is for their own protection, for their favor, for their honor, for their dignity. Allah has appointed angels to be writing down every single little deed. And all of these records are being collected and compiled and amassed and will all be presented on the Day of Judgment. Well, if somebody's doing good, they'll be fine. I mean, would we complain? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we were told on the Day of Judgment, you have been forgiven, you're going to paradise, everything is taken care of, would I be like, well, where's my records? You got my receipt? It's like I'm telling you, it's like you get to the register and they're like, you know, we're having a special deal, you get all this for free. I need a receipt. They're going to be like, who is this bozo? You're getting stuff for free, man, put in the bag and leave. I need a receipt, right? Would any one of us ask that? Of course not. On the day of judgment, if we're told, there will be no account, oh, thank you, bye, I'm out of here. <laughs> All I need to hear is the word no. There will be no, I'm out, peace, thank you very much. All right, that'd be me. 
But why is everything still being written down if this person is good, if they're doing good? To honor that person in front of all of humanity. That person's deeds will still be weighed. So everyone can see. Everyone can see the scale, the side of the scale of good deeds hitting the ground. And the sins all the way lifted up. Go stand next to it and take a picture. <laughs> right? Go take a picture with it. It's me right here. Like to honor that person, everyone's going to say, look, 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 look at him. Look, look, look at him. When that person will still be given his book of deeds, he's going to paradise. He's being asked, come sit under the shade of the arsh of Allah. But he'll still be given his book of deeds in his right hand. And the Quran tells us, why will he still be given the book of deeds in his right hand? What will he do? Ha'um. Ha'um. Hey, hey, look. Check me out. Iqra'u kitabia. You want to read it? It's a great story. I can tell you the ending. Spoiler alert. Right? He says, Ha'um, iqra'u kitabia. Want to read it? Take a look, take a look, take a look. And we like, stop showing off, man. Get your book out of my face. But he's saying, Iqra'u kitabia. Iqra'u kitabia. Iqra'u kitabia. We say, read, look, look, read, 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 look. So much joy and happiness. A celebration at that moment. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here. But on the flip side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 95, And as for these people who are opposing you, oppressing you, persecuting you, doing all of this, all of these terrible things, Haramun ala qaryatin ahlaknaha. That these people, the, 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 the towns that we destroyed before, the, the towns and the people before them who behaved the same way that they're behaving, who came before them, ahlaknaha. We destroyed them. Wa haramun alayhim an yarji'u. Annahum la yarji'un. It was forbidden upon them. Meaning it was not allowed for them, it was not allowed for them to ever be able to come back. To ever be able to come back. And the reason why it's said, there's some very interesting grammatical nuances there. It's because by eliminating part of the sentence, it emphasizes the fact that haramun, they are never ever getting a second chance, ever again. Haramun ala qaryatin ahlaknaha. Now Allah explains, just in case we didn't understand. It is forbidden, it is haram, it is impossible that these people that we destroyed in the past will ever get a second chance. They are never coming back. But what's very interesting is that this is again from the Quranic subtlety, the Quranic beauty, that yarji'un could literally mean physically they will not come back, meaning they won't get a second chance at life. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also saying yarji'un ar ruju'. Meaning even spiritually, that when people kind of make their bed, they choose their fate, they resign themselves to this conduct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, and once they've aligned themselves with the people of the past who were destroyed, who are annihilated, punished by Allah, Allah says, La yarji'un. Those people are not given the opportunity to repent. So spiritually they will not come back. Physically they're obviously not coming back. But even spiritually they will not get a chance, not get an opportunity to turn things around. Ayah number 96. So basically this is the explanation of Kullun ilayna raji'un. Each and every single one is coming back to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying each and every single person is returning back to us. So if you do good, you'll find good waiting for you. If you do bad, you'll find bad waiting for you. Ayah number 96. Hatta idha futihat ya'juju wa ma'juju wa hum min kulli hadabi yansilun. Hatta, and this is, the, this is the law of Allah. This is the sunnah of Allah. This is the way that this dunya, that this world operates. That those who turn to Allah, 
who strive to please Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor them and dignify them and continue to grant them opportunities. And those who disbelieve, those who oppose Allah, and those who oppose the people of Allah, those who obey Allah, they are resigning themselves to an eternity of misery. Their worldly life will become miserable and wretched, and it's an eternity of misery that awaits them. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the way that this world operates, the spiritual consequences in this dunya, ayah number 96, until. However, even in this world, there is coming a cutoff point. Where that's it, it's a point of no return. It's an expiration date. If you took care of things, you took care of things. If you didn't, too late, too bad. The deadline has passed. And what is, what, are some, what, are the, what is that deadline, generally speaking? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a very specific example from that deadline. He says, Hatta until Ida, that time when Futihat, it will be opened. When you use the word Futihat, Fataha, to open something, use it in the passive form, futihat, it oftentimes is an expression in the Arabic language, which means something being released, something being let loose, something being released. It's an expression in Arabic. Until it is released, they are released. Who is being released? Ya'juju wa ma'juj. Ya'juj, ma'juj. Now what, is, what are some details about ya'juj and ma'juj? So let me give you kind of like a brief overview. We have in the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we have prophecies about the end of times. The events that will occur closer to the Day of Judgment. Alamatu Sa'a. Right? Many, many classical scholars have compiled them, written about them, talked about them. And I'm going to give you a brief sequence of events. So the way that the sequence of events kind of play out, is that towards the end of times when fitna will become rampant and there will be great spiritual trial and tribulation, that there will arise a very negative force in the world and that is called the Dajjal. The Dajjal will arise. At the same time, a Muslim leader will also arise at that time, referred to as the Mahdi. Al-Mahdi al-Muntadhar. Right, that the Mahdi that is waited for. So the Mahdi will come. And at that point in time, there will be great like conflict throughout the earth. Spiritual conflict. At that same time, shortly thereafter, when the conflict is at its peak, it's all culminating towards some big, major, epic, you know, showdown, Middle Earth type of deal. At that point in time, Isa ibn Maryam, Isa alayhi salam, will descend from the heavens and will return back to the earth. And Isa alayhi salam will basically join the believing forces at that time and will be the one who will personally slay this Dajjal. Once that occurs, evil will disperse and will run for the hills. Shortly thereafter, this man Mahdi, the Muslim leader, will pass away. Isa salam will be there as the shepherd of the believing folks. And then there will come a time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command Isa alayhi salam to take the believing people and to retreat up into the mountains and specifically the Mount of Tur is mentioned in some of the narrations, the hadith. And they will retreat up there. At that same time, the reason for that retreating up to the mountain is that there are a people, a nation called the Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. They are a nation that is talked about in the Quran that one of the earlier believing kings, Dhul Qarnayn, had come across. Hatta ida balagha bayna saddaini wajada min duni hima qawma la yakaduna yafqahuna qawla. Right, he came across the people there who didn't really understand what he was saying. They didn't speak very well. Like they, he, they couldn't communicate very well. But they were able to figure out the fact that they were being tormented. They were being pillaged and raided by a very vicious, bloodthirsty, 
insatiable people called the Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. And for the protection of these people, Dhul Qarnayn, the king, commands his army, he himself participates, and they erect and construct a wall behind which these Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, these people are locked up behind. And they are basically now trapped within that area. Now real quickly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject this a little bit. There's a lot of discussion that you'll find, unfortunately, about where this wall is, what is it, where is it, who are these people, what exactly else do we know about these people, all these other types of details. The deal about that is, and I'm simply quoting the Mufassirun here, the classical Mufassirun. They say where the Ya'juj and Ma'juj are located, has absolute, it is not one of the pillars of our faith. It is not one of the points of our aqidah. It, will, it is not one of the questions that will be asked about in our graves. It is not something that will be questioned about on the Day of Judgment. Therefore, just mind your own business. That's the conclusion. Right? So the answer to that question is, don't worry about it. Alright? Why don't you worry about yourself? So that's the classical answer. Secondly, to be a little bit more maybe, you know, um, to, to, to just kind of entertain the question a little bit more. Because somebody could very well argue that, you know, we've covered every inch of the earth at this point. Right? And so, we don't see anything like that anywhere. In a thousand years ago, they just said, okay, there's a lot of the world we haven't seen yet. Now we got a satellite up there. And we can see pretty much any place on the earth. So it's like, well, what is the Qur'an talking about? So we, come, we know. See, this is the thing. This is why I'm, uh, that first answer is the correct answer. Because if you work on the fundamentals of faith and iman and belief, you are already okay with the reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that which we do not know. And there is much that we do not see, we do not know, we are not aware of, we never will be aware of, we never will know, we never will see. But it is in the knowledge of Allah and we believe it to be a reality and a truth. Whether we're talking about angels and malaika and the life of the hereafter and this and this and this. All of that, we believe in all of that. We don't see it. We can't put our hand on it, our finger on it. We can't, you know, geographically locate it. But we believe that. So that's what the fundamentals of iman do for a person. It's easier to deal with the unknown. Because you're okay with not knowing. Because you've surrendered yourself, submitted yourself to Allah and His infinite knowledge. And so that's kind of the answer to that. But anyways, moving along. So Dhul Qarnayn kind of puts these people behind these confines and that's it. Now everybody is safe from the, from the trouble that these people cause. Now, moving forward, there's a very interesting hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Where the Prophet ﷺ says, La ilaha illallah. One time it's actually reported about him that he was, um, this is in Bukhari and Muslim, by, narrated by Ummul Mu'mineen, Zainab bint Jahsh, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala anha, that he was kind of taking a nap, he was lying down and he sat up all of a sudden, he says, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. And then he goes on to say, Waylul lil Arab. So what is wrong with these Arabs? He was preaching and teaching the people and you know the Islam was slowly but steadily growing and spreading but a lot of people were still kind of resisting. So he says, وَيْلٌ Arab. What is wrong with the Arabs? مِنْ شَرْقَدٍ اِقْتَرَبَ فَتْحُ الْيَوْمِ مِنْ رَدْمِ يَعْجُوجُ مَعْجُوجُ مِثْلَ هَذِهِ وَحَلَّقَ تِسْعِينَ And the Prophet ﷺ said that what is wrong with the Arabs that the time, it's come so close it's come some, so close, the end of times have come so close, the day of judgment is so close, that he said today, today, and then he signaled like this with his hand, he said this much of a hole was opened up today in the wall containing Ya'juj and Ma'juj. What's wrong with them? When will they wake up? That's what he meant when he said, I and the hour, the day of judgment have been sent like this together. So, that's a little bit about what we know. So going forward, Ya'juj and Ma'juj basically will bust out from that wall and will read the ayah, but the Qur'an very vividly describes that these people will be like a plague on the earth. Like, in, you know, when, when there's a big old anthill and 
you break it up, and what happens? The ants come like pouring out. Min kulli hadabin yansilun. You'll see them from afar, from the hills and the mountains. And what's very interesting about that is the passage about Dhul Qarnayn actually talks about mountains in that area. You'll see them from afar flowing down, yansilun, flowing like water would rush down the mountainside, the hillside. You'll see them flowing down. Endless amounts of them, hordes and hordes of them. One other thing that we know from some other narrations of the Prophet ﷺ is the fact that the Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they outnumber mankind, the reg- other human beings, insan, by some narrations mention a thousand to one. For every one human being, there are a thousand of them. So they outnumber, and so you'll just see them flowing out, scour, you know, just scouring the earth, covering the earth. And there are some narrations that talk about that the very first thing they'll come across will be like a body of water, a huge body of water, like an ocean, a sea. And as soon as they hit it, the first wave of them, when they hit that ocean, by the time the second wave of them come, it'll all be completely dry. They will have completely just even exhausted all the water in the ocean. They will eat everything. They will destroy everything. They will pillage and ravage the entire earth. So the earth will just be barren. While all this is playing out, Isa ibn Maryam, Isa alayhi salam, and a group of believers are up in the mountains seeking refuge there, protected from the evil of this, of this creation of Allah, this test. Their time will have become longer and longer. Some narrations mention up to like 40 days. And it will start to kind of wear and tear on them. They'll, they'll, they'll run out of supplies and food and things like that. And the situation will become very desperate. So they'll finally make dua. That, oh Allah, alleviate this suffering of ours. And when they make that dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause a disease. To basically appear amongst this creation. Ya juj wa ma'juj. And they will all die from this disease. It will be like a plague, like a virus. And they'll all die from this virus. And once the believers are told that they're all dead, it's all finished. Oh, I, I missed a couple of narrations. Some of the narrations mentioned that when these, this creation of Allah, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, as they're ravaging the earth, they'll eventually get to a place where they'll be like, we've covered the entire earth, destroyed everything on the earth that they'll take arrows and they'll shoot them up into the sky. Say, now it's time to kill the inhabitants of the sky. And Allah will command the angels, the malaika, to take the arrows, to color them red and throw them back down. And the arrows will fall back to the ground and they'll say, we've killed everything now. And that's around the time when they'll make that dua and these ya'juj wa ma'juj, they'll die. The believers will come down but find the entire earth. Literally, some of the narrations talk about that the earth, there won't be a place to put your foot on the earth. There's so many of them that the entire earth will be filled with their dead corpses, their bodies. The entire earth will be filled with their dead bodies, their corpses. And by now, they'll start to have rot. And so the believers will make dua, Ya Allah, this is, this is wretched. Like, we can't. We can't go live down there. So they'll be told, okay, go back up to the mountain for a little while longer and it'll... And then the narration mentions that birds will come, snatch up the bodies, the dead bodies of all of these Ya'juj and Ma'juj and take them away and then it will rain, it'll pour. Some narrations mention again, up to 40 days it will rain, pour continuously. And it'll wash up the entire earth, replenish the water supply on the earth. And vegetation and things will start to grow again and now the believers will come down. And that will be a time of peace and tranquility and faith and iman. And these good times will reign on the earth. And then from there the, the, the rest of the alama to sa'ah continue from there. That basically shortly after the passing of Isa alayhi salam, then a breeze will blow. All the believers will basically very gently... Uh, and graciously pass away due to that breeze blowing and only evil will be left on the earth and then that basically that evil will be on the earth and that sign of the fact that now there's only evil on this earth will be that a people will even go and destroy the Kaaba, the Baytullah, 
they'll smash it, they'll break it. And then finally the day of judgment will occur. La taqumu sa'atu hatta la yuqalu fil ardi Allah Allah. That the day of judgment will not commence until it is no longer said in the earth. Allah Allah is no longer said in the earth. And so that's kind of like a quick brief synopsis. So now going back to the ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hatta idha futi had ya'juj wa ma'juj. Then until that time, when ya'juj wa ma'juj will be released. Now, what does that mean until that time? That basically, when those end of times occur, ya'juj wa ma'juj are let loose upon the earth and all of this, that will basically be such a clear, that'll basically draw the line. That'll say, this is it. No more. Those who believe, believe. Those who didn't believe, that's it. The line has been drawn. This is the conclusion. This is the expiration date. These major, major alamat. These major, major signs. وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that hadab in the Arabic language is kind of like mountains when you see them in the distance. That's called hadab. That from each and every single like, from all the mountains in the distance, يَنْسِلُونَ You'll see them flowing down. Destroying the earth. And part of the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does give this type of a, uh, this one, one little example from all the alamat of sa'a, and that too, if you notice it, Allah doesn't provide us a lot of detail here. Who are Ya'juj and Ma'juj and what will happen and how long will they be and how will they die? All of this is not provided at this place, but what is provided is very fascinating. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almost provides just one quick little, very vivid graphic imagery. Imagine them just flowing down, like ants, just flowing down from the mountains and the hills. That graphic is provided, why? To help make it a reality, to provide an image. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 97, this leads right into this ayah, وَقَتَرَبَ إِقَتَرَبَ Sound familiar, إِقَتَرَبَ? When's the last time we heard this word, إِقَتَرَبَ? Right? إِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ Alright? Not advanced verb families. <laughs> Talking about the Qur'an here, okay? So, إِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ The beginning of the surah. This is a very beautiful thing. Before I even comment anymore on the ayah, ayah number 97, we are not far away from the conclusion of the surah. This is in fact the last passage of the surah. This is the conclusion of the surah beginning from here. And this is a beautiful, beautiful style that the Qur'an has. That in, especially in lengthier surahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oftentimes will conclude the surah with the summary of the surah. Not only that, but the surah will conclude with the same message that it began with. To make sure that we do not forget the point, the objective of all of this study. To remind us of what we really sat down to understand. And to bring us back, to tie everything together at the end. See, and this is why we talk about oftentimes, you know, looking at the Qur'an, seeing the Qur'an as a form of literature, so that we study it as such as well. Looking at the Qur'an, seeing the Qur'an as guidance, and studying it in that way as well. Looking at the Qur'an as, you know, the core of our beliefs, the fundamentals of our faith, the source of our legislation, our history as mankind, as humanity. All of these things are true. Another thing about the Qur'an that we also have to understand, we have to also start looking at the Qur'an on as an entire curriculum and each individual surah is like a course this is a hundred and fourteen course curriculum a degree in studying the guidance for all of mankind this is it this is a hundred and fourteen course study of how to live life and it's got a hundred and fourteen courses to it and so each and every sur single surah like that is kind of like, is structured in that way, in that fashion. And we see that here. So Allah says, Iqtaraba, very close, has come. What has come so close? Al wa'adul haqqu. Al wa'adul haqqu. Al wa'ad is the promise. Al haqq is the truth, the true promise. The reality, the true promise has come extremely close. Waqtaraba al wa'adul haqqu. Now what does that mean to someone? That the true, the true promise has come very, very close. 
regardless of what it might mean to a person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what it will mean at that time. When that promise finally arrives, what will it mean at that time? فَإِذَا هِيَ شَاخِصَةٌ أَبَصَارُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَإِذَا This is mufaja'a. Rahamkullah. This is mufaja'a. Alright? All of a sudden. Alright? All of a sudden, هِيَ شَاخِصَةٌ Alright, just in case if you know, somebody listening to the recording didn't, don't understand why I'm laughing about the Day of Judgment arriving. <laughs> somebody sneezed as soon as I said all of a sudden somebody sneezed and mashallah they have a very unique sneeze, alright? فَإِذَاهِيَ <laughs> Then all of a sudden, هِيَ شَاخِصَةٌ It will be شَاخِصَةٌ شَاخِصَةٌ in the Arabic language is a very interesting word. It means something you can't ignore. Like a huge mountain, like a peak that sticks out from the middle of the mountain range, shakhisa. From this comes shakhs. Shakhs means a personality, like a very unique, distinct personality. Right? So shakhisa, something very noticeable, something very obvious, something very apparent, something you can't ignore, you can't deny. Fa'idahiya shakhisa. Then all of a sudden it'll be right there in their face. Abasaru ladina kafaru. And what will it do? It will basically grip the gazes, the eyes of those who disbelieved. So shahisa refers to something being very noticeable, which is kind of like an expression in Arabic, which means that they won't be able to take their eyes off of it. When something is very noticeable, you can't move your eyes away from it, right? You just stare at it. So they'll be staring at it. Those people who disbelieved will be staring at it. They won't be able to take their eyes off of it. And they'll just be stunned. Just stunned beyond belief. Not be even being able to react or respond or move or nothing. They'll just be just dumbstruck. They won't be able to take their eyes away from it. And what will they say at that time? Ya waylana. Ya waylana. They'll curse themselves. Ya waylana. They'll feel pity and sorry for themselves. They'll talk about how they themselves are so sad and so pathetic for ending up in this situation. Ya waylana. Qad kunna fi ghaflatin min hadha. Most definitely, without a doubt, we were fi ghaflatin. Again, sound familiar? Wa hum fi ghaflatin. In the beginning of the surah, Allah was saying about them, Allah is saying that they are drowning in heedlessness. They are disconnected. They are spiritually numbed out and just drowning in this spiritual dilemma. Now Allah is telling us after all this, they will say this themselves. Ya waylana, they will curse themselves. Qadakunna fi ghaflatim in hada. We were drowning in our heedlessness. We were so spiritually numb. Min hada from this. They don't even know what to call it. Saying min hada tells you two things. From this, they're not saying min al saati, min al wa'ad al haqi, min al akhirati, min allahi, min al hisabi. None of that. Min hada. This tells you two things. Number one, hadha is what? What do we call that? Pointing word for close or far? Close. This. You can only say hadha about something that is close. Means they are standing right there looking at the day of judgment occurring in front of them. That's why they're saying hadha. That's why they're saying hadha. The second thing is saying hadha kind of also expresses the fact they already said shahisatun abasaru ladina kafaru. They'll just be staring at it completely dumbstruck. And the only words coming out of their mouth will be kunna fi ghaflatim min hadha. How could I have not expected this? They're so, this, you can feel the sadness, the regret, the sorrow in their words. Kunna fi ghaflatim min hadha. And then they'll say, بَلْ كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ Rather, we were ظَالِمِينَ Those who, do, who did wrong, those who do wrong continuously, consistently, we were those who stuck to wrong. We didn't just do wrong, we stuck to it. We were stubborn about it. We did not budge 
from that wrong that we were conducting, that we were doing. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the Mufassirun mentioned something very interesting about Allah saying that they will say, Bal kunna zalimin. That this is the evidence of, and the proof of the fact that even these people, the people that are being punished, even they would dare never argue that they are being punished wrongfully. Because they know how much evidence is stacked against them. That this is not Allah just punishing these people, but prophets came. Messengers came. Divine scripture and re revelation came. The message was taught. The message was preached. The message was established. But they are the ones who opposed it, neglected it, slandered it, persecuted the people, oppressed those who delivered the message. They made these choices themselves. And they will accept that and admit to that on that day, بَلْ كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ They'll come clean. بَلْ كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ We did this. We did all of this. This is our own doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in ayah number 98, it will be announced to them, it will be said to them, إِنَّا كُمْ إِنَّا كُمْ Most definitely y'all. وَمَا تَعْبُدُونَ And all that which y'all worship, مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Aside from Allah, حَصَبُ جَهَنَّمْ حَصَبُ جَهَنَّمْ حَصَب refers to, this is very interesting, this is very interesting. Some Orientalists try to actually say, see, this is proof and evidence for the fact that the Qur'an has not been preserved properly because the word is hatab, not hasab, hatab. Hatab is what you call firewood. Hatab is what you call firewood, like wood that is burned. And if you look at the sod and the ta, the base of the letter, doesn't it look the same? What's the difference? Just that line that sits on top, right? The ta. There's a little line that just sits on top of that base. So he says, see that line got erased or wasn't recorded properly and now they got a wrong word in the Qur'an. But again, like I've mentioned many, many times and I always tell students that a lot of times the problem is a lack of study of classical Arabic. This is why traditional Islamic scholarship, when they prepare them to be, you know, proper, you know, um, students, and uh, proper teachers of the book of Allah of the Qur'an to properly study and understand the Qur'an, part of the course of their study is classical Arabic poetry, pre-Islamic Arabic poetry. Why? Because that unlocks a lot of the linguistic nuances, rhetorical uh, functions, and even a lot of the vocabulary is found there. And when you look back in ancient Arabic classical Arabic poetry, you find that the word hasab is actually a very, very legitimate word. Hatab is what you call fire wood. That's what you call wood that is used to burn a fire. Hasab, however, hasab is what you call any other type of fuel. Like, you know when you just grab anything and just throw it into the fire to just make the fire bigger? Anyway, anyhow. Take off your shirt and throw it in there. Find a rug, throw it in there. You know, anything you can find, you just start throwing stuff in there. That's called hasab. So not only is the Qur'an not incorrect, not only is the Qur'an on point, but it's so much more powerful and eloquent than saying hatab. Because these people, that would actually not make any sense. Or maybe at the most it would be majazan, it would be more allegorical or figurative. That you and everything you worshipped will be firewood. So figuratively speaking, you'll be like firewood. It'd be a metaphor. But this is literal. Just like when you throw anything into a fire to just burn it, keep it burning. People, human beings, they're idols that they worship, they're false gods that they deified. Those things will just be thrown in there like throwing a bunch of random things into a fire. That's the image. <laughs> you and everything that you worship other than Allah will be the random just things thrown into the fire to fuel the fire. Now there's a very interesting question here. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah has narrated about him 
that one time he comes into the masjid and he finds a lot of the believers there. This is after the time of the Prophet So the tabi'un, the generation that learned from the Sahaba, they're there. And they must have been having some regular study of the Qur'an. And Ibn Abbas ta'ala said, you know, I'm really disappointed. And they're like, why? He's like, we're studying something and nobody bothered to ask a question that should have been asked by a student. And he said, we apologize, please forgive us, but what is it? And so he goes on to say, didn't you read this ayah? Ayah number 98 in Surah Al-Anbiya. إِنَّكُمْ وَمَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ حَصَبُ جَهَنَّ You and everything else that you worshipped other than Allah will burn in the fire. He said, doesn't that make you ask a question? Let's see. Does that pique your curiosity about anything at all? If people and anything and everything that they worshipped other than Allah will be put in the fire. Is there a question? What's the question? What's that? Right, I'm starting to hear now. Right. Isa ibn Maryam. Right? Didn't they worship Isa alayhi salam? Isa ibn Maryam. They worshipped Isa alayhi salam. So what about that? Is this ayah actually saying wal ayadu billah thumma la ayadu billah? Isa ibn Maryam, Rasulullah wa kalimatu would be put in the fire of hell? Of course not. Absolutely not. So then, but how do we reconcile that? There's two answers. Y'all should know this. And what's the, the, the asma mawsoolah? The ism mawsool? Alladhi, alladhina, allati, alati. Then we learned the last two were ma and what did we say was the difference between ma and man? Man is for people, and ma is whatever. Allah did not say wa man taabuduna. He said ma taabuduna. He's talking about the statues and the sculptures and the trees and the rocks and the stones that you worshipped. That will be put in the fire of hell with you. The second answer to this as well at the same time that Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhum at that time provided, he said you have to read further. And this is very profound because I keep telling you this. The answer to a lot of the questions that arise when we study the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is found in context. And so it's very important to study the Quran like this. This is why we take one whole surah and study it all the way through. Very, very important. Because he said you have to read on further. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say a couple of ayat down in ayah number 101? <inaudible> Those people who were granted our blessings and excellence, our good, a beautiful reward from Allah. <inaudible> Those people who were granted a beautiful reward by Allah before, from beforehand. Like Isa alayhi salam, right? He was already dignified by Allah before all this. Before the Day of Judgment, before anyone ever worshipped him or attributed anything bad to him. He was already honored and dignified by Allah. Allah says, Ula'ika anha muba'adun. Those people will be very, 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 very far away from the fire of hell. And it says it in a nominal form. That's why I said it like that. And not only that, but muba'adun doesn't just mean they are far away. They have been made far away. They have been placed far away. Placed by who? By Allah. Allah says, I'm looking out for my people. Isa alayhi salam is a prophet of God. He's a beloved slave of Allah. We'll take care of him. They don't get to, they don't get to, 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 to you know, somehow have this come back on him. They don't get to implicate him in this. They don't get to implicate him in this. And the same thing goes for anyone else, any other prophet or a pious righteous person that anyone ends up attributing something to, something that they would dare never say or do, that we have to understand those people were already blessed by Allah. Allah says they're already taken care of. They're already protected. It's the other, it's the other filth that they used to worship that that will be put with them in the fire of hell. إِنَّكُمْ وَمَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ حَصَبُوا جَهَنَّمْ That will be the fuel of Jahannam. أَنْتُمْ لَهَا وَارِدُونَ 
Now Allah is talking to, again, continuing to talk to them directly. In Nakuma Mata Abudun, He says, Antum wariduna laha. It should, normally in grammar, it'd be antum waridun la. Here Allah says antum laha waridun. Waridun, this is such a powerful meaning. And I'm going to conclude with this. Even though it kind of extends on further, the passage. But I'm going to conclude with this. Warada, in the Arabic language, warad al ma. It refers to basically going to water, going to a watering station, going to the watering hole, going to the well to get water. That's what the word warada refers to. That's what it references. Allah says about this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them, Antum, all of you, waridun. You will go laha. Laha refers back to the fire of hell. Jahannam. You will go to Jahannam like, like an animal goes to the watering hole. When an animal's thirsty and the sun is out and he's been walking for a very long time and the watering hole gets within sight, do you, any, do you even have to guide the animal to the watering hole anymore? He'll just go. His thirst will take him the rest of the way. His thirst will carry him the rest of the way. You will go to the fire of hell just like that animal goes to that watering hole. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Provides this abnormal sentence structure, لَهَوَارِدُونَ To say that was the only place, like you will, it'll be part of your curse, part of your torment, part of your punishment, that the only thing you'll be able to see, the only thing that you'll be able to fixate on and move towards will be the fire of hell. It's like that moth flying into the flame. The moth to the flame, that will be you, Allah is saying to these people, you to the fire of hell will be like no different than that moth to the flame. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, aside from this imagery, and this, it's a figure of speech, and uh, like a, an idiom, and expression in the Arabic language, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use this word, waridun, about going to water? There's a Quranic subtlety in this as well. When these people are put in the fire of hell, naturally it's the fire of hell, they'll be thirsty. They will ask for water. They will ask for water. What will happen when they ask for water? Will it be provided? Yeah, it will, actually. But what kind of water will be provided? Right. Thumma subbu fawqa ra'sihi. Burning, scalding water. Burning, scalding water will be poured over them onto their heads. It'll just destroy them. It'll burn their faces off. Some narrations talk about the fact that they will drink this burning, just terrible water. And it will literally destroy and rip their innards apart. Some narrations talk about that they will be provided a drink. But that drink will be what? It'll be the filth of the people of the fire of hell. The filth, the bodily waste, the bodily fluids from the people of the fire of hell, that's what will be given to them. And they will drink that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So I realize it's kind of a, kind of a heavy point to leave it, but we'll break here inshallah and then we'll continue from here in the next session. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahu wa bihamdik.